What's up YouTube? What's going on guys? So we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff in today's vlog. Uh, hip shifts in the sumo deadlift, how I safely round my back and how I cue it and, and build up and all that stuff for my um, comp deadlifts where I start pulling rounded. I'm piggybacking off the last video where I talked about uh, pulling with a rounded back and we're going to talk about acclimation sets and how to gauge it based on adrenaline. So let's just dive right into it. Today was a kick-ass squat day for me. Here's 451 pounds, super controlled, really positioned. You can see how slow I'm hitting the eccentric and how I'm really just trying to move into position and I almost I don't want to say I make these harder but I'm thinking more about position on my slightly lighter acclimation sets and as I build up each set I start adding a little bit more adrenaline so you'll see each working set or each acclimation set on the way up I do a little bit less poised and with a little bit more aggressiveness and the reason why I'm doing this is I'm trying to gauge where my RPE is going to be based on that adrenaline that you often get from your top set. And this is something advanced athletes can do really well. I think the hardest thing with the RPE uh, scale isn't so much rating your sets afterwards. It's more so predicting what weights you can get based on things like subjective adrenaline, position, stuff like that that really can overshoot or undershoot your RPEs a lot. So look at this 528. A little bit more hyped up than my 506, but still pretty positioned and controlled, okay? Now, normally, uh, based off that, I probably would only take in 10 10, maybe a 15 pound jump, but I ended up bumping it all the way up to 551 and I just let my adrenaline loose here. Look how aggressive I'm getting on the bar and this is kind of a sign of a more advanced athlete. Um, I, I'm really good at knowing what I'm capable of with that adrenaline and that's something you have to learn as you become more advanced, okay? So I chose 551 and watch this thing fly up with that adrenaline pretty easy right there and I had to do a double at RP7 and I probably would have chose a weight that was too light of what I was actually capable of had I based it off of how I was feeling on some of those warm-ups. So you have to know when to kick that adrenaline on because sometimes you want to do your sets more poised like this back off here 451 again or, or whatever the kilo conversion is. Look how I'm setting my shoulders. I'm going real slow, real controlled. You'll see how ugly I look when I squat because I'm packing my lats so hard and, and that's how I do my back off sets and a lot of my warm-ups and acclimations but right when I'm about two or three sets away from that true top set that's when I let that adrenaline go more and more each set and that really lets me uh, help or it helps me gauge where I might be at potentially for that top set and you kind of learn what your strength is in adrenaline when you're a, um, a more advanced athlete as you kind of go through the years same thing here a great representation my uh, client Luis one of my youngest clients who I'm trying to teach this to Look how easy that 330 is compared to his 314, especially the first rep when compared to the side. Even though there's a huge weight bump, especially at his percentage, that's something like I was trying to teach him, like, hey, if we get some more adrenaline, a quicker eccentric, things like that, it can really alter your top set potential, okay? And so that's kind of all I'm saying there. Now, pulling with a rounded back. How do we do this and do it safely? Watch what I'm cueing here first. We got to go over the brace first. I'm tucking the pelvis and I'm making my obliques and so as long. I'm getting my shoulders back and I'm bringing my rib cage down. Those are the main things I'm thinking about as I ascend through my brace. Now, what is important about the brace up top, and I specifically believe if you want to pull with a flex back, you should have a top-down setup, okay? And the reason why is you can get such a better brace. And what you'll notice is I actually start all these initial reps with a very neutral back. I'm not allowing any flexion just yet. And what I do is I get that pelvis under me, I get tall, but keep the rib cage down, I get the back tensioned and engaged, and I brace into this perfect position up top and I hold that all the way down and each rep as I build up in weights because I'm always doing singles or doubles or something like that on the way up every set as I build up in weight I just allow for a little bit more rounding in my start position so the top down setup is always exactly the same and it's that positioning and tensioning that gives me the ability to never lose my back position as I exert through and so what I'm doing is I'm actually concocting my body into that flex position and holding it there so look at me pelvis under rib cage down shoulders back big brace now I got the belt on here as I'm getting heavier and look you can see there's a little bit more flexion still a warm-up set though so I'm building up to this slowly you'll see it again here and each set it's like I'm it gets easier for me to actually get my brace into the right position as I kind of build up you'll see I'm real methodical in the beginning and then as I kind of cue this I remember how to do it every session a little bit better as the warm-up sets go on and then it just becomes like muscle memory so stand tall pelvis under me, rib cage down, shoulders back, lats long, boom, and then look at that start position. Now I'm allowing more flexion and I'm getting more explosive. Let's look at my top set. I'm going to do this a lot quicker now. 
pelvis under me, rib cage down, lats long, and look at that flexion. You see how I purposely start more rounded. So the key here is you're actually starting perfect up top, but then positioning yourself in the start right before you go into a more flex position. That way we don't lose it. You can see here all the way from the start, my first warm up rep, very neutral. And as the sets go on all the way to the right, I start to get a lot more flexed in my back, but it's minimal. We're avoiding that end range, like I said. And because of this huge top down brace, I'm able to do this without losing any tension through the lift. My back position does not change, even with that 640 pound pole that you just saw on the screen. That was 640. Um, I, now, to explain the mechanics of why this um, works, the physics behind why this actually can help you, look at my hip, right where the hip bone is, and then look at the distance between that point and my shoulder. That is what we call the moment arm of the hip extensors, basically how much demand the hips have. Now, whenever we flex our back, that distance gets a little bit shorter. And so we're kind of cheating that range of motion by allowing us to stand a little bit taller and removing some of that range of motion on the hip extensors. Now the problem with this, you would think, oh, okay, so everyone should just pull, um, pull rounded. But the issue is if you don't do this correctly, you end up missing a lockout. You can't re-extend the back and pop the hips through because your hip extensors and your back aren't strong enough to get through. And the way I conquer this to avoid that happening is I actually do a ton of neutral back, extremely slow low intention kind of not slow but very tension deadlifts in the off season and it's not until I get about maybe 8 to 12 weeks out where I start pulling a little bit more in my competition style where I'm flexing over and the reason why this works is because all that tensioning and that practicing of the huge brace and forcing my back extended and putting a bigger demand on the hip extensors it allows for me to train through that range of motion and just get so much more tension and and bracing in that back and in the hip extensors and that way when I get to a more flex position later on one, I just spend less time pulling flex, which is less risky. But two, now I've practiced all that tensioning so much that by the time I get here, I'm strong enough to get my hips to pop through on anything. I never struggle at lockout and I've never missed a deadlift at lockout because of pulling like this. However, many people do because they don't do this the right way. So you have to periodize it and you have to use a top down setup brace, in my opinion, if you want to do this safely and correctly. And you'll see here actually in my uh, last um, couple back offs that I did right Right after that top set of 640, uh, again, I get away from that really fast, aggressive pulling and I do my back offs a lot more tensioned, a lot more poised. You can just see how much tension I put into these. And this really allows me to focus on that even distribution of tension and get everything strong the way it should be. Now I want to go over Kristen's training. Um, so quickly, I'm just showing her squat progress just to keep you guys updated. She hit up some doubles on squats also like me. She worked up to 221 and then a top set right after that. She was doing buildups of doubles with 227. Uh, we didn't see any shifting or any goofiness going on in her squat. So we conquered that stuff that we got from the car drive. However, um, what we did find later on when we got home after reviewing some footage, and that's what I want to talk about, was a huge glaring issue in her sumo deadlift that she's probably actually been experiencing for a while. But we we hadn't fully caught on. Now our issue was we always assumed when she got her hip hike and some issues with her um, squat that that issue was manifesting over into the sumo deadlift and creating pain there. But we realized that these were actually kind of two separate issues. And so what I want to show you was this set right here. We filmed it from the front. And what's funny about this is she pulls this. You probably don't see anything too major here, but she was dealing with some pain and we couldn't figure out why. We're like, we fixed the hip hike, the squats went good, no pain in the squat. Um, and so what I did is I come over to her and, and we're like reviewing the footage. We're trying to see maybe what she was doing wrong. We couldn't really figure it out. We knew it was probably something with her mix grip or whatever. But when we got home, we reviewed the front footage of my camera that we didn't look at in the gym and watch this. You see how that hip closed off? I'm going to play this again for you guys in slow motion. But what's happening is she's actually only loading her right hip in the sumo deadlift currently. She's totally closing off her left hip into internal rotation, the glute shut off. Look at here, shift left or excuse me, to her right, that, that um, left side just shuts off into internal rotation. And her hip flexor is taking way too much strain and stress. The right glute is active and loaded. The left glute is completely shut off. And that's always been her problem glute that she doesn't have um, a lot of connectivity with. And what we think is that eventually... Um, or, or not eventually, but over the years of her practicing, the, the last year and a half of her practicing the sumo deadlift with a mixed grip, it's created some imbalances where she shifts in the sumo. Now the issue is, is this problem manifests 
um, inner sumo and her squat with the same pain patterns, but it usually only flares up really bad when something goofy goes on in her squat, like that hip hike after that very long car drive we had with her. And usually when we fix that, it's very mild in the sumo deadlift, but we realize that both of these problems are probably compiling on top of each other and exasperating one another. And so it's, it's creating some more imbalances in that pelvis. And so anyway, what I wanted to do was just kind of demonstrate uh, with her some things that we're going to do to fix this issue. And if anyone else is dealing with this issue, it is actually semi-common with mixed grip sumo pullers to see some sway. Not everyone's manifest in, in total dysfunction or, or pain or anything like that. But if, for those of you who are dealing with that, I want to show you how we're going to transition her. We're going to try a bunch of different things from like hook grip to reverse mix grip, um, maybe even contemplating going to conventional most of the time and only doing sumo sparingly. Um, we're going to be doing a bunch of mobility drills that I'll, I'll kind of show you some sneak peeks of that we we're able to film today. Um, we're going to do all sorts of things that really um, are going to conquer this issue long term. And, you know, it's funny, I got a comment on my last video and I really didn't like the way it was phrased. Um, it kind of bothered me how the guy went about it because I feel like the industry is really torn right now, especially the physical therapy world on what works and what doesn't. Some people say, oh, you got to fix everything movement based. And I think that's the foundation of what's true. But the problem is, is if you have a huge glaring issue in a movement, oftentimes you just can't fix that by just getting on the barbell and cueing proper movement. I've been coaching since 2014. I've already tried that. With Kristen, we already tried this in the gym to fix some of this dys dysfunctional movement. She literally just just can't like her hips don't cooperate no matter what we cue with her vocally and so I'm going to be showing some of the tricks that we're going to be doing with rehab with um, uh, some of these movements some of these the stretches and the foam rolling things that we're going to be doing to help with this as well as what we're going to be doing different movement wise how we're going to fix the imbalance from a movement standpoint which is a long-term fix um, that will get it gone for good and I'm also going to demonstrate how quickly and easily this can be conquered if you do everything correctly and so that's what the next vlogs will be about, what we're doing with Kristen to really get around this and how we're going to kind of beat this long term. So stay tuned for that, guys. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up if you found this helpful. Uh, leave any questions down below. I'm going to see you guys in the next vlog really soon. A lot of content coming to the channel, guys. I'll see you next time.